Hello and welcome to episode 92 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR and we are just three short weeks away from week one. Very clear now that the NFL is going to happen. We need to get our big boy pants on for that. Of course, I am joined by the mover of ADPs, the lord of your top 150 rankings. It is fellow co-founder Evan Silva. Evan, what's going on? NFL teams are practicing. Uh, those people that were calling us idiots for thinking there would be an NFL season for months and months have somehow evaporated into dust. And um, it, it's a great, great time of year. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any preseason games to bet on and play DFS with, but I'll, I'll take what, what, what we're being given right now. And it's, it's a lot of information. We've had a lot of uh, early injuries. Uh, we've had some significant rankings movement. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Yeah. In an alternate universe right now, Ryan Griffin is just throwing touchdowns to Tanner Hudson and it's just total, total pants off. Uh, anyways, for anyone new here, I hope that you'll go back and listen to a lot of the pods we've already done this off season over the last few months. We've covered a ton of ground. We're going to cover a ton more ground over the next few weeks with a lot of podcasts. Be sure you're subscribed. It's free. More importantly, as Evan said, football is happening my friends, I know a lot of people have tuned out all off season and maybe not done their normal preparation because they thought football wouldn't happen, but it is. And we've been working on our draft kit for the last five months, keeping continuously updated. It's just $35. If for whatever reason, the season does end up getting canceled, you'll get a free kit whenever the NFL resumes. Uh, I think there really is a big edge to be had. Like you can see it in some of these best ball drafts that we've been doing on underdog and on DraftKings, FFPC, like you know, and we have a ton of content and rankings up for this best ball stuff. You can see in the best ball stuff that it seems like people are less prepared than they normally are. We can certainly get an edge. So head to establishrun.com. Check out everything in our draft kit. Really appreciate everyone who has already purchased. All right. As Evan said, there's been a lot going on. Camps are open. Guys are hitting in pads. Uh, we're seeing first team reports from beat writers. We've had some injuries, which we're going to get into. We have 10 or 11 topics here we're going to hit on today. I want to start with this Todd Gurley story. And and um, it was like early and I was reading and I came across this report from Vaughn McClure of ESPN. And the quote was this. And Vaughn McClure has covered the Falcons for a while. I consider him probably one of the best Falcons beat reporters. He says, during the early phases of the Falcons acclimation period, Todd Gurley walked with a noticeable limp and wore a compression sock on his left leg. Yet he showed speed and explosion in drills. He went on to say one source familiar with Gurley from his days when the Rams told ESPN, Gurley can't put his foot in the dirt and go like the old Todd Gurley, but he can still be a productive back. And so I, I tweeted that out, and I think it set off, you know, major alarms. And immediately I was in drafts where Todd Gurley wasn't going into like the fourth or fifth round where previously his ADP was 29.5. I think that might be a little bit of an overreaction, but if you listen to the bus episode, I was out on Todd Gurley even before this. I think Evan was maybe a little bit more optimistic than me. Does this quote scare you at all on Todd Gurley, Evan? Um, I think it's somewhat uh, expected uh, and we, we didn't, I didn't have to make any rankings movements here. We are, I mean, we're not that far off, uh, off of, of Todd Gurley in terms of straight up positional rank, but we are way lower when you're looking at the top 150, um, you know, like maybe 20 spots lower or something like that uh, than, than his ADP. So look, we, we know that there is a, a major downside to Todd Gurley when we're drafting inside those first, you know, four rounds or so uh, we are, absolutely more concerned with the downside of the players that we're picking then when we get into the sixth, seventh round. That's why we like, you know, Will Fuller, a, a guy like we, we like taking chances on a guy like Will Fuller because he doesn't go until the sixth or seventh round. And we don't really have to worry about his floor there as much. But when we're investing top three and four round picks on guys, uh, we want to be concerned about their floor. And Todd Gurley has, you know, a scary floor because at some point that knee – can, could, could potentially just give out on him. Uh, Dirk Cutter, their OC, expressed concern about the health of Todd Gurley. I've read some practice reports that indicate that they are eliminating him, which is smart on, on, on their behalf. Uh, but I, I think that Brian, this is a good reminder that Brian Hill is not a terrible pick at the end of drafts. And again, about the, the red light uh, floor that Todd Gurley presents. Um, although he did enter a good situation in Atlanta, um, th there's a lot of downside risk there. 
what about ceiling risk? Like, I, I think that in, even in a best case scenario, Todd Gurley might only play 60% of the snaps, right? Like, let's say he's perfectly fine. The knee is fine. I don't see them. I and mean, that's not what the Falcons have done anyways. They've been using, even when Devontae Freeman was healthy, they were using Judge Ito Smith and, and Brian Hill and guys like that. So I kind of think in the best case, that Gurley only gets 60, 65% of the snaps. Now, I understand the third round, 60 to 65% of snaps for a running back in a really good offense is, is valuable. But I think there's also ceiling concerns with Todd Gurley as well at this point. And for me, you know, round three, especially round four, round five, I'm taking wide receivers and and not uh, running backs typically. So that's just another reason from a construction standpoint for me to be out on Todd Gurley. But yeah, it certainly doesn't feel good to uh, read this quote. And I think it did sink the ADP of Todd Gurley, at least a little bit for now. Maybe it bounces back some as more casuals get in as we get closer to September. Bad news on Jalen Hurd, Evan. One of our favorite late round flyer picks. I've been taking Jalen Hurd a lot, you know, round 18. Uh, you've had to pay a little bit more for him lately as Buzz has kind of crept up, maybe round 15 or so. But the fear, and we're recording this Monday, uh, 2 p.m., the fear right now, and it sounds like they're testing for an ACL. And usually when they're testing for an ACL and that word gets out, usually it comes true. So let's operate under the assumption that Jalen Hurd, unfortunately, will miss the year with a major knee injury. We also know Debo Samuel is out. Well, not out. They they think he's going to miss at least week one and maybe some more games with his foot issue. I mean, they're down to like Brandon Ayuk, the rookie, Kendrick Bourne, and then like something like Trent Taylor or Dante Pettis or Richie James. Um, any ideas on what you think San Francisco will do now that they're missing Debo and Jalen for the first part of the season? You know, I think it's just reinforcing that you know, you want to be strong on George Kittle. You want to be strong on Brandon Ayuk. And Brandon Ayuk has apparently been tearing up practices, um, praised by Kyle. You know, one thing to note about Brandon Ayuk is that he comes from an Arizona State program that is run by Herm Edwards. You know, Antonio Pierce is, like, on their coaching staff. Kevin Mawe is on their coaching staff. They've got a bunch of former NFL players uh, on their coaching staff at Arizona. And Kyle Shanahan said that Brandon Ayuk just came in immensely prepared He's been crushing on the practice field. We've been way higher uh, on him than ADP for weeks and weeks. And I'm probably going to have to move him up because now I know that his ADP is going to start creeping up mm-hmm. and, and trying, you know, trying to catch us. Uh, so, uh, but I'm, I'm going to look at the ranks. This just, this just happened a couple hours ago, the Jalen Hurd or the, the news that Jalen Hurd's injury was severe. Uh, but I'm going to have to look at that right after we get done with this podcast. Uh, again, reinforcing that you know J- Jimmy Garoppolo to George Kittle is my singular favorite stack of the entire 2020 fantasy football season. If you want to look down the depth chart, Kendrick Bourne, despite severe athletic limitations, you know he ran four six eight coming out of college. He's really built to be a role player, and that's how he's been used. But he may have to become a little bit more than that, at least until Debo Samuel comes back. Um, and he's going to be a guy that I look at maybe putting uh, toward the end of the top 150. Um, we can you know, start to talk a little bit about Dante Pettis and, and Jordan Reed, um, Trent Taylor, you know, just guys to keep in mind. Uh, but to me, still, we're, we're still really looking at the top of the target pecking order in San Francisco, and that's going to be George Kittle. That's going to be Brandon Ayuk, and to a, a lesser extent, uh, Kendrick, Kendrick Bourne. Yeah, it seems like somebody like Kyle Shannon, who doesn't just have a system that he runs for everybody, he's going to adjust the scheme to his talent. I could see a lot of two wide receiver sets, uh, at least until Debo Samuel gets back. And maybe that's Kittle and Jordan Reed. Maybe that's Kittle and Ross Dwelly or, or, or whatever it is. And I could see a lot of run plays, too. And we're going to get into and the running game play here. And they're going to a lot of who, remember, he yeah. missed like six weeks last year. Yeah, and Yuschek will definitely be involved a ton as well. So, so yeah, I, I think that going beyond the Ayuk Bourne stuff is definitely a case of FPS. Um, but Kendrick Bourne is definitely going to have a red zone role, as always. Uh, speaking of the 49ers, Matt Macchio, one of our favorite beat writers uh, for the 49ers, covers the 49ers, have covered the 49ers for as long as I've been doing this. I mean, God, Matt, I, he's been just doing this for so long at such a high level. He sent out a tweet that he thinks Tevin Coleman and Raheem Mostert will share early downtime, and Jarek McKinnon, old friend Jarek McKinnon, will play on pass downs. It's been so long since Jarek McKinnon played. I feel like people have like written him off and forgot about him. And maybe he's not healthy, but all the reports early on say that he is. Now, my concern with taking Raheem Mostert in the fourth, fifth, and, and even the sixth, I'm a little shaky. Maybe I shouldn't be, but definitely in the fourth and the fifth, I'm like, man, if he's going to share the early down work and lose the pass down work, like where are we getting this huge floor ceiling combo from Raheem Mostert from? So I, 
I think that Matt Machia's take is probably right. Uh, the de- the gap between Tevin Coleman and Raheem Mostert in ADP is far too egregious. Right now, Raheem Mostert 56.9 ADP, Tevin Coleman 84.9, Jerick McKinnon 175.6, and I haven't mentioned Jeff Wilson yet. So with all that said, and now we have the, in light of the Jalen Hurd injury, in light of the Debo Samuel injury, any new takes on the San Francisco backfield? Yeah, see, I was unwilling to take Jarek McKinnon particularly seriously until he got out on the practice field and show he could string together practices. Um, be- just because, I mean, he's been physically debilitated for two years. I mean, we have not seen him play football. Um, well, I guess the last time he played any sort of competitive version of football was 2018 training camp, which when apparently he was tearing it up. Uh, Matt Barrows, another uh, long time. I think he's been doing almost as long as Matt yeah. Mayako. Uh, Matt Barrows has been covering the 49ers for a really long time. In, in uh, one of his recent pieces, he was talking about how Jarek McKinnon didn't look any different uh, than he did during 2018 training camp. Uh, you know, and uh, McKinnon, of course, later tore his ACL during that training camp, and he just couldn't get his knee right in 2019 training camp and wound up missing the entire season. Now he's back and healthy. He's still, I mean, he's younger than uh, Raheem Mostert. Uh, he is definitely better in the passing game than both Tevin Coleman and Raheem Mostert. And so if he is able to stay healthy, I think that that's probably the role that we should expect him to play. I think that that's what Matt Barrows and Matt Mayako both believe to be the case and that they're going to use a hot hand situa- a hot hand rotation on the early downs and McKinnon in the passing game. And so now that we have seen that McKinnon is at least able to do physical things day after day. Um, I mean, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to put him in, I'm going to put him into a place where he's now someone that we're very, very willing to draft, if not wanting to draft, because he's going to be really, really cheap. I mean, he's going to be, you know, 13, 14, 15th round, RB5, RB6 type of guy. Uh, but I'm willing to take a, a chance on him now, uh, now that I know he can at least string together a few days of, of practice because that was a complete unknown considering his history over the last two years. Yeah, I know we spent a lot of time on the 49ers. And one thing that I reason that I think that it's important is, as Evans mentioned many times, I mean, 49ers first month schedule is just outrageous. And we're going to be talking about them a ton in DFS because their matchups are going to be so, so, so good. So I do think it's worth thinking pretty deeply about the 49ers as we get closer to the season. Let's move to the Colts. Uh, you mentioned hot hand. And so we got some coach speak. And people ran with it. And I, you know, I certainly was not going to run with this coach speak where they say Marlon Max, the starter, uh, you know, and that's what you're going to say. I mean, I mean, Jonathan Taylor is a rookie. You're not going to insult Marlon Mack by saying, oh, no, Marlon Mack's going to come off the bench behind Jonathan Taylor. Now, I did notice that the coaches in Indy said, well, Marlon Mack's a starter, but it's going to be a hot hand situation. The guy so, so, so more likely to me, at least to get the hot hand is Jonathan Taylor, who's just I don't think people realize like from a size speed production standpoint, how good of a prospect Jonathan Taylor was 233 pounds, 439 ran for 6,100 yards in three years at Wisconsin caught 26 balls as a junior. I I mean, uh, Jonathan Taylor, if this was like 10 years ago, would have been like a top five pick in the NFL draft, like for sure. So I don't, I I know uh, the ADP gap is massive. I don't know how long Marlon Max can be able to hold off Jonathan Taylor, I guess my main point of bringing this up is I didn't want people to buy into the coach speak about Marlon Mack being the quote unquote starter. But what did you think about what's going on with Indy as we're up to date now in the middle of August? So I think that the Colts are just set up to have a ton of team rushing attempts because first of all, they have the softest schedule of, uh, according to uh, opposing win totals uh, during the 2020 season. And that hints at future positive game scripts. They have, uh, they're returning all five starters on the offensive line from maybe the best offensive line in the league. Uh, they didn't need to go trade up for Jonathan Taylor in the draft. They had Marlon Mack. They're bringing back Naheem Hines. Jordan Wilkins, I think, is a, a serviceable. Uh, you know, he would have been a serviceable number three back. They did not have to go do that, uh, but they did. I think they want to run the ball. We saw that from them last year. I think that they don't want to put Phillip Rivers into situations where he's having to throw the ball 40 times a game. Uh, Their defense, I think, is going to be better this year. They're a team that is maintaining incredible continuity from the offensive line to the head coach, to the offensive coordinator, to the defensive coordinator. Um, Obviously, they're changing out the quarterback, but the quarterback knows Nick Sirianni, the OC, and Frank Reich from San uh, San Diego. Yeah. Um, You know, they they were all together on the Chargers. So 
you know, I think that this is going to be a, a very, very run heavy team. And that allow that will, even when Jonathan D Taylor takes over, which I agree with you is inevitable. I still think that Marlon Mack is going to be involved to some extent. And um, I'm, I'm willing to take Marlon Mack time and time again in the 10th round, uh, because I think that he has a chance at some standalone value. And if something happens to Jonathan Taylor or Jonathan Taylor's fumbling problems creep up, you know, back from he fumbled 18 times in three years at Wisconsin. He was never asked to pass block at Wisconsin. He caught very, very few passes. Um, there is some downside there to, to Jonathan Taylor enough for me to like Marlon Mack uh, in the you know, ninth, 10th, 11th round, which is usually where he goes. I mean, nobody's excited to take Marlon mm -hmm. Mack this year and I get it, but I'll take him definitely as my RB4, my RB5. Yeah, kind of similar to the carry on Johnson situation, which we can talk about more on another pod. But but yeah, uh, one thing that I would say for people who like, and we were talking to Leone about this a little bit about thinking in the context of who's going to be a first round pick in the 2021 fantasy draft or the 2022 fantasy drafts. And you can start to shape your takes that way. And God, I mean, if Jonathan Taylor isn't a first or second round pick next year, I'd be shocked with Marlon Mack uh, contract coming up and just the way that they're going to, Indy's going to play in their offensive line and their scheme and Jonathan Taylor's prospect profile and that's why if you go to pat crane's dynasty rankings you'll see how high jonathan taylor is and, and i think i've mentioned this before but the situation for jonathan taylor reminds me a lot of josh jacobs last year to where we really can't have a high reception or target expectation for jonathan taylor but he could jump on the scene and be just become one of the best rushers in the league and his situation his environment is a lot better than what than what uh, josh jacobs was jumping into last year but he's going to come in here and, and he, I think he's got even uh, better breakaway like long run potential he did a, that a lot uh, at Wisconsin so sort of like um, a rich man's version of Josh Jacobs uh, entering last year, I think what Josh Jacobs like a third or fourth round pick now he's a consensus mm -hmm. second round pick I could see you know that a very similar situation playing out for Jonathan Taylor in the future yeah I did an article in the, in the draft kit last year where I tried to project guys who were going third round or later who would be in the first round this year and I had some good hits I had Derrick Henry on there Miles Sanders Josh Jacobs I had Godwin I had Eckler on there I also had OJ Howard God I had Kerryon Johnson Cy I had Christian Kirk Cy but anyways I'm working on that article for this year now and and we'll see how it goes um okay rankings change you have moved Randall Cobb into the top 150 at wide receiver 58, 135th overall, just ahead of Anthony Miller. And obviously, uh, you guys can go back and listen to my conversation with Pat, uh, Matt Harmon about Anthony Miller, who he is very high on. Anthony Miller, Randall Cobb is kind of, uh, no one's going to be excited about Randall Cobb. Had 55 catches last year for Dallas as their number three wide receiver entering his age 30 season. Seems like he's been around forever, man. He's, I can't believe he's only 30. Like he's been in the league for 10 years. I can't believe he's only 30. But anyways, pretty good situation here. And if you think Will Fuller is not a load-bearing wideout, i.e. Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks aren't getting 8, 9, 10 targets a game, maybe there is enough for Randall Cobb in there to sneak in. So what made you put Randall Cobb into the top 150 now? Yeah, just sort of reevaluating uh, the Texans situation. I think that they're going to be, first of all, they have one of the toughest schedules in the league. Uh, they're going to be throwing the ball often. I think their defense is just going to be absolutely miserable. And, you know, I like taking shots on their receiver core. And although we are very high on Will Fuller and we're going to stay that way, we also do have to understand that there is a major injury risk to Will Fuller. So if Will Fuller uh, goes down, as he has been known to do, then targets are going to be distributed among a wide receiver core that becomes Kenny Stills, Randall Cobb, and Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks also has a concerning injury history. Kenny Stills missed, already missed a big chunk of training camp um, on NFI. They, don't have, they do not have target commanders at tight end. And Deshaun Watson is not a check down quarterback. Uh, like he doesn't check down to running backs frequently. So I think, and I think that Randall Cobb just has a very secure role. You know, he's not the sexiest player. I think he's a, a very, very fine best ball pick. I think that he does make sense in stacks with Deshaun Watson. Um, and I think that secure role in a high volume uh, passing attack, and Bill O'Brien consistently over the years has finished uh, like top 12 in offensive pace. Um, and Deshaun Watson plays at, at his best, uh, I, I, I think, just from eyeballing him and looking at, looking at his uh, statistics in, in certain situations. Deshaun Watson plays at his best when he is playing with urgency. Um, 
So that's secure role for Randall Cobb. I mean, I think that he's got a pretty good floor and I think he's going to mix in some spiked weeks. And he's a guy that I want our audience to be taking late in best ball drafts. Um, and I think he makes some sense as a redraft pick as well in sort of deeper leagues as a wide receiver five, six, seven. Yeah, he's certainly extremely, extremely cheap. I can be honest and say I haven't taken any Randall Cobb yet this offseason, but I'm going to at least think about it now. Okay. Um, report out of New England, and we've talked about this a couple times before, but now from Jeff Howe, no sure thing Sony Michelle ready for week one. Latest rankings in the top 150, James White 100th overall, Damian Harris 102nd overall. Sony Michelle has been dropped completely out of the top 150, obviously Rex Burkhead. Lamar Miller not in the top 150 at all. Uh, first of all, you can talk about that. And then I want to talk about James White because I know we've had some internal debate about where we should have James White ranked. So talk to the people first about Sonny Michelle getting completely removed and James White 100th, Damian Harris 102nd. I mean, the writing on the wall for Sonny Michelle has been just really, really bad for a long time at this point. Um, you know, you talk to Dr. Chow about him. I don't want to put words into Dr. Chow's mouth but I mean he's not optimistic for the future career of Sony Michelle um, you know just based on the knee injuries and now you have the foot injury and the beat writers don't even know if he's going to be ready for week one we know he contributes nothing in the passing game he was terrible last year and I, there's no reason for us to be drafting Sony Michelle pretty much at all at this point we already we, we've been way lower than consensus on him throughout. Like n none of our audience should have any shares of Sony Michelle at this point, but we're just, we're going to make sure that that continues and we're going to be willing to take late round, throw late round darts at Damian Harris, maybe a little Rex Burkhead is like the, you know, the last pick in your draft. Uh, but James White, you know, and Norv Turner has talked about this. Cam Newton really uh, had a, had an excellent 10 game run at the beginning of 2018 when they, when the Panthers were emphasizing getting the ball out of his hands quickly, throwing passes to running backs on early downs, which is really, really efficient uh, way to play because defenses are in, you know, like base sets with their nose tackle and their strong side linebacker on the field and not, you know, they're, uh, you know, not six defensive backs, not three safeties. Like they're, they're in their heavy packages. When you throw passes in those situations, you have a competitive advantage on the defense, the Panthers uh, realized that, and Cam completed like what 68, 69% of his passes that year. McCaffrey broke out from a receiving standpoint. James White, I think, is going to be on the field a ton at this point, um, based on you know Sony Michelle and the the lack of you know established production from Damian Harris and uh, just how the, how this running back is, uh, picture is playing out. Lamar Miller is still on. Um, uh, he opened the he opened training camp right after they they signed. I mean, he's coming off a torn ACL, and he opened training camp on what I think it was NFI or or PUP, and he's he's not ready to go. So I think the guys that we're looking at from this backfield are clearly James White and Damian Harris, and um, unfortunately, consensus is still way higher than us on James White. He's like RB thirty two in FFPC drafts over the last four days, and we have him at RB thirty eight, um, but. I think he's going to be on the field a ton. And then I think that Damian Harris right now is set up to be their main early down back. No guarantees on that, but um, he's a guy that I'm willing to take late. Yeah. I think, you know, from talking to Leone, the point on James White is that these pass catching backs are so valuable. Their best ball win rates are really good because a target is worth so much more than a rush. And, you know, people say, well, he's only going to get four or five carries. He might only get one or two carries, but if you can project six, seven targets, it's just incredibly valuable. And like Evan said, if you think he's going to be on the field a ton, uh, there's a lot of value in James White. My concern, and, you know, maybe it's a bad take because Christian McCaffrey did catch 107 balls with Cam in 2018, but, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Tom Brady's rate of throwing to running backs has to be just way higher than Cam Newton's likeliest rate of throwing to running backs so I think it's a hard thing to to quantify Tom Brady throwing to James White out of the backfield was just a ton of chemistry I know Evans talked a ton about that I'm not sure Cam will have the same chemistry with James White but we'll see I do like the Damian Harris part of it all right let's get to the big dog man we are warming on the big dog and I can't believe I'm saying it. it's not good for the brand but I'm actually warming on the big dog as well you have moved the big dog up into tier one Big Dog is now with the other guys, Chris McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Ezekiel Elliott, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook. Now, Derrick Henry is in that tier. What made you move Derrick Henry 
into this top tier of running backs. And and along with that, given the way drafts are setting up, is Derrick Henry now the best pick if you hold the number six overall pick? Yeah, he's the number six overall pick, I think, right now. And uh, Dwayne McFarlane, uh, who's you know an excellent analyst that uh, is going to be doing a bunch of stuff for us this year, did last year, work, also works for PFF. Um, he thinks that there's a legitimate debate for Derrick Henry to be number four overall now. And he's the, you know, the, the usage guy, that that's what Dwayne, Mar- Dwayne mm-hmm. McFarland does. You know, he writes the utilization report and he is, you know, on top of this, just like we have been in terms of Derrick Henry actually being becoming a true every down back this year, they lost Dion Lewis. Um, and they essentially tried to replace him with Darrington Evans, which in a normal year, I suppose, could have worked out. But Darren, Darrington Evans is a late third round pick out of Appalachian State with, you know, with no, on, on almost no, on very, very little practice time uh, with his new NFL team. I mean, that's taking a big leap of competition um, that is, you know, uh, being, you know, b- behind the eight ball in terms of preparation heading into the season. And then, he started to fumble on the practice field. He had two, uh, two fumbles in practice the other day. And as some people pointed out that, hey, Darrington Evans, he had zero fumbles at Appalachian State. That, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. What he needs to do in, in order to get on the field and earn opportunity in, his, in the NFL is to show that he can be trusted. And fumbling twice in practice is no way to show that you can be trusted by your NFL team. Um, and I mean, I think the winds have been blowing in this direction anyways, you know, regardless of, of how many fum- how many times Darrington Evans fumbles on the practice field. Uh, I think that Der- the, the receiving outlook has been pointing upward for Derrick Henry uh, entering this season. We know he's going to get, the, we know the carries are going to be there. Uh, I think that we can sort of bank on, you know, him being efficient, maybe not as efficient as last year, but being efficient. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great offensive line. It's another team with a ton of continuity. It's really, really, really well-run, well-orchestrated offense. And if we can just get him a few more catches, you know, a few more screen passes. I'm begging Arthur Smith th- this year, just have two screen passes to Derrick Henry in the playbook for every single game. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really, really going to help him. He has not ever cleared 18 receptions in a season. And I think he can get to 30-35 this year. Uh, considering the, the the current situation yeah if I was Arthur Smith I would do the play action into the screen right like you get you play action Derrick Henry and then you involve him in the screen it's just everybody's going to swarm to Derrick Henry on the ground uh, Derrick Henry has never caught more than 18 balls in a season never been targeted more than 24 times and this kind of goes back to college I mean no coaches identified him as a pass catcher but like you said they let Deion Lewis go Deion Lewis saw 32 targets last season which doesn't sound like a lot but on the Titans who throw so infrequently it kind of was a lot. And behind Darrington Evans, I don't even know these guys like Dalen Dawkins, Signoris Perry. Like it seems unlikely that you would put those guys on the field ahead of Derrick Henry. And for me, why I'm warming to Derrick Henry even more than the receiving stuff is rushing efficiency against schedule. I mean, our friends at Sharp Football identify the Titans as projected to have the softest schedule in terms of rushing efficiency defenses that they'll face. And even mentioned, Evan mentioned the continuity. They did lose Jack Conklin. Brandon had only had them 13th in his offensive line rankings, but I think returning four starters does matter on that offensive line for the Titans. Returning four starters, then they replaced Jack Conklin with their first round pick. Yeah. So So, they're they're serious about keeping this, this running game intact. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're comparing, if you're on the clock at six overall and you're comparing Derrick Henry to Michael Thomas to Devontae Adams and picks like that, it's like, well, yeah, I probably like Michael Thomas and Devontae Adams a little bit, more, but from a roster construction standpoint, getting a running back in the first round is going to set you up to attack wide receiver third, fourth, fifth round, which is where uh, I personally like to be. So yeah, I'm warming on Derrick Henry for those reasons. We'll talk about the downside in DFS when we get there, when you play Derrick Henry and all of a sudden the Titans fall behind and then you're in big trouble and and that's going to be a problem. But I think from a season long perspective, I'm certainly warming on Derrick Henry. We'll see where he comes in uh, in salaries. By the way, salaries on DraftKings and Fandle are both out. Very exciting talk more about that soon all right speaking of arguments in slack this dj moore situation man i didn't even want to get involved in this because i really don't have a strong take on dj moore you moved after like pressure outside pressure well not outside pressure internal pressure you moved dj moore up from wide receiver 15 to your wide receiver 10 passes mike evans odell galladay calvin ridley 
um, all still in the same tier. And I know you're going to say they're all extremely close together. DJ Moore certainly ascending age 23, age 23 season caught 87 balls last year with some woeful quarterback play. I would note that uh, Matt Rule did recruit DJ Moore here to Temple pretty hard. So yeah, it's a new coaching staff. DJ Moore ended up going to Maryland, but Matt Rule has liked DJ Moore going back to high school. So for what it's worth. Uh, anyways, tell the people what happened here. They want to know, why did you move DJ Moore up from wide receiver 15 to wide receiver 10? Taylor KB just interjected himself into the rankings. <laughs> I don't know. Does he want to just do the rankings? He, Taylor, do you just... Man, I caved to, to Taylor KB pressure and I uh, moved up. I don't really care, though, because they're all, like, in the same tier. Like, you know, it's Mike Evans, it's Odell Beckham, it's DJ Moore, it's... um. You know, who else is in there? Like uh, Galladay. Calvin Ridley. You know, uh, Calvin Ridley's in there. Juju. You know, I mean, these guys are all awesome, awesome picks. DeAndre Hopkins is even in there. Um, these guys are all great picks, and they're literally all just stacked right next to each other because their projections are similar. Their, you know, their floor ceiling expectations are similar. And so to move DJ Moore from wide receiver 15 to wide receiver 10, it, it doesn't even really, you know, move the needle. Um, but at that time, we were, I think, four spots below consensus in terms of wide receiver rankings on DJ Moore, uh, you know, than FFPC ADP. And, you know, I put out a tweet that said we were demonstrably lower on DJ Moore. That's just that, that was a fact. But when you look at it from a tier standpoint, when you look at it from a top 150 standpoint, it just it, it doesn't make a big difference. So I, I did cave to the pressure of Taylor KB. And, you know, again, every time I argue with Taylor KB, he turns out right anyways. So I just try to avoid those arguments, cave here, and, uh, and I, I gave in to him like a, like a schmuck. Yeah, a lot of you guys probably don't know who Taylor is. You can go back and listen to, we did, uh, and I did a podcast, just me and Taylor, where we talked about some stuff about a month or two ago. You can go back and listen to that. Um, let's talk about DJ Moore's situation just in a vacuum for a second, though, not relative to these other guys, because he is breaking in a new quarterback. He's breaking in a new offensive scheme. We don't know exactly how they're going to use Curtis Samuel. So I think there's some unknowns with DJ Moore, maybe more unknowns than there is with, say, Calvin Ridley than with Odell Beckham, who uh, is healthier and hopefully has a new scheme also, but hopefully entering a better scheme. So I, I think that you can poke some holes in DJ Moore relative to these other guys. The best thing that DJ Moore has going for him is I think his skill set fits really well with what Teddy Bridgewater does well. And DJ Moore is ascending. I mean, he's freaking 23 years old. So, but just in a vacuum, what do you think about DJ Moore? No, I love DJ Moore. I mean, you know, he's the, that big, like, uh, it's really like the second tier of wide receivers. I mean, I pretty much love everyone yeah. in that, in that tier. Uh, Adam Thielen is also in that tier. All those guys we just talked about. Yeah. But I mean, I, I had him, I guess, relatively low within that tier uh, because of the things that you mentioned, because they're changing, they're changing everything. I mean, they're changing the coaching staff. They're changing the quarterback. I do agree with you. Uh, and, and they also added Robbie Anderson. McCaffrey obviously is going to have a massive target share. I think Ian Thomas can take a def, you know, tef, definitely take a step forward. I expect Curtis Samuel to. Um, so you know, DJ Moore's target competition within his own offense is you know genuine. I mean, there there is legit in-house target competition. We don't know who exactly is going to mesh immediately with Teddy Bridgewater. I like the way that DJ Moore plays in relation to the way that Teddy Bridgewater mm -hmm. plays, which is at a low A dot. DJ Moore, one of the best, has consistently been one of the best run after catch receivers in the NFL since he entered it. He's really, really young. Um, I don't know, there's some stat in our, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's, uh, it's, it's in our tiers. And it shows you, I think he's like, you know, top 10 in receiving yards to the age of 23. Um, or, or something like that over the last decade. I mean, he's he's really been off to a great start in his career. Um, but the reason that I did have him previously lower uh, in that tier is because of of those uncertainties. But I, I love him enough that you know, again, it, it's it's no skin off my back to just move him up a little bit if if that's what the people want. Okay. Speaking of moving up a little bit, and, and I, I you know, moving a guy up one spot, we're not typically going to talk about, but I do think people have. An interesting debate when they're on the clock, you know, round four, Terry McLaurin versus A.J. Brown. You decided to move Terry McLaurin one spot ahead of A.J. Brown. Um, I think the biggest knock on A.J. Brown, if there is one, is just unsustainable efficiency. 20 yards per catch last year, eight touchdowns on just 52 catches. And the way the Titans want to play, I mean, God, you saw it in the playoffs. A.J. Brown had 10 targets in three games 
in three playoff games. And I, I know they got in some tough spots and everything, but God, I mean, I, you know, how many, how many wide receivers that go in the third round can line up for three playoff games and get 10 targets. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to knock AJ Brown. I certainly prefer Terry McLaurin from a pure volume perspective, but you decided to make the move McLaurin over AJ Brown by one spot. What were you thinking there? It's just based almost entirely on my self drafting. And, you know, I'm not going to put ranked guys ahead of other guys when I'm, you know, drafting the other guy, you know, ahead of, of the, the top guy, you know, I mean, I'm going to take McLaurin ahead of AJ Brown. And I think that there could be a 40 target discrepancy between the two. I absolutely love AJ Brown. He reminds me of Terrell Owens. Um, he had 84 targets last year and look at what he did. He mm-hmm. didn't play 70% of the snaps until week 10 last year. And look at what he did. You know, it's one of those situations where look, you know, maybe he won't be as efficient, but he's going to be able to cover up for a lot of that. Maybe even, you know, overcompensate for that uh, based on the fact that he's just, he's going to be playing more and he's going to go from 84 targets to like 110. And if he gets like 120, then, you know, we, we, he, he might outscore McLaurin with 150. Uh, mm-hmm. So, but no, but I mean, I'm going to be drafting Terry McLaurin ahead of AJ Brown. You know, I've already seen myself do that you know, have that decision and I take Terry McLaurin. And so then, you know, correspondingly, we go into the rankings, we go into the change log and we make the change. And that, that's what happened in this situation. Yeah. By the way, for you guys who are following along, corresponding to Evan's top 150, he also, he's also keeping a change log every time he makes a change in the top 150, he puts the date, explains the change that he made. Uh, okay. Jets situation and, you know, tough schedule for the Jets and Adam Gaze and all that. But I do like Chris Herndon, man. He's getting a lot of buzz. And also, I would note that Denzel Mims is already hurt, which isn't a good sign for him. Vincent Smith, who was uh, kind of filling in for Denzel Mims on the outside, he's already banged up. So, yeah, they have Jameson Crowder, who's everybody thinks going to get a ton of targets. Um, they have Rashad Perriman, who I think we both think is underrated. But, man, there's just not that many tight ends. And I talked about this when we talked about Noah Fant maybe a few weeks ago. There's just not that many tight ends that as a rookie are able to perform from a receiving perspective and go over 500 yards. Chris Herndon did that as a rookie, just had the absolute disaster of a season last year with suspension and then injury. But yeah, I mean, I like Chris Herndon, man. And I keep talking about that late tier of tight ends. And I would put Chris Herndon in the mix. I wish he wasn't attached to Adam Gaze. I wish he wasn't attached to this brutal schedule that the Jets have. But I do like Chris Herndon just in general from a volume and from a talent perspective. So Jets situation, a pass got you right now. Can we stomach any of these guys? Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, I understand that Jamison Crowder feels like a, you know, a three condom pick, but um, anyone that has a chance at like 140, 150 targets, we, you know, and is going in like the freaking eighth and ninth round, uh, we need to be hammering that, actually. Um, last year, he had 122. The situation has really spread out. You know, the, 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 oh, both the perimeter receivers are changing. Um, Denzel Mims has been dealing with this hamstring injury. Uh, I, you know, the, you mentioned that the, the schedule is tough. That could actually work in favor of the passing game if they're playing from a high lot. They lost their two best defensive players in Jamal Adams. Who they traded C.J. Mosley, opted out. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm all about drafting Jamison Crowder in like the eighth and ninth round. I think that you smash the button on him. And I'm going to move Chris Herndon up. I like the fact that Adam Gase came out and said he's our starting tight end because you know, they did play Ryan Griffin like almost 100% of the snaps last year and gave him a contract extension after the season. So that would suggest to me, you know, using like trying to be pragmatic that, that they want to continue to play Ryan Griffin to some extent. But Herndon has just apparently looked so good on the practice field. They're like, screw it. We're rolling with Herndon. There's a lot of target upside there. Um, I like taking Perryman too uh, late. He, you know, all these guys, this is what's nice about these guys is that their ADPs are all very, very late. Even, even Darnold, he's like the last mm-hmm. job secure quarterback to get drafted. I mean, people are taking Drew Locke ahead of him, which I think is uh, ridiculous. But um, yeah, their, their offensive line also, they're returning zero starters, but their talent got a lot better up front. So there are, you know, oh, and also uh, from weeks six through 17 last year, they did start to play faster. They finished 11th in offensive plays from week six through 17 last year. That's something that Adam Gase has talked about for a long time, wanting to do very, very, very rarely in, 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 you know, actually implemented it, but maybe, you know, maybe he will actually this year. So 
know, again, these Jets pass catchers are very, very cheap. Don't want any part of, of Le'Veon Bell, but uh, Herndon, Crowder, and Perryman, I think all very fine draft picks. Yep. Okay. Last thing we're going to talk about today is the Rams wide receivers. And we had some questions on the Rams wide receivers. No news here, no rankings change. I just wanted to bring it up because we haven't really spent much time talking about Rams wide receivers. You have Cooper Cup, 36th overall. Robert Woods, a.k.a. Bob Trees, 39th overall. I mean, Cooper Cup last year coming off the ACL just went absolutely nuclear to start last year. I think it was like five 100-yard games in his first eight. Um, Close the year quieter, but still finished with 94 catches and ton touchdowns. They go out there, replace Brandon Cooks in-house with Josh Reynolds and maybe Van Jefferson. But yeah, I mean, people are going to be on the clock. They're going to be thinking, should I be taking a Rams wide receiver? Which one should I be taking? And I know this from DFS, and it's happened to me before when I couldn't choose who I liked more between Cup and Woods and Cooks. I would just be like, I can't decide. I'm taking none. And then I would just get trucked by like these huge Cooper Cup games, you know? And so I don't want that to happen to people in season long. So how are you thinking about the Rams wide receivers? Um, yeah, we have Cup and Woods very close together. I believe Cup is wide receiver 18 and Woods is wide receiver 22. I think that Cooper Cup has shown a higher ceiling than Robert Woods, and that's a main contributing factor to why we have Cup ahead of Woods. I think Woods is a rock-solid wide receiver two pick. I think that some of the ways that he gets hailed in the fantasy community is a little bit overboard. Um you know, I think he's a fine wide receiver two pick. I think that in 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 his tier of receivers, there are a lot of receivers around him, like DJ Shark, even T.Y. Hilton, guys that have legit wide receiver one upside. I'm not sure that Robert Woods has that. Um, I think Cooper Cup has obviously shown that he can produce at a wide receiver one level. And um, that's sort of my take on the situation. If you want to go deeper down the depth chart, I think Josh Reynolds is an excellent uh, you know, wide receiver pick in like the, the wide receiver 55 through 65 range. He goes really, really late in drafts. And um, I think that Van Jefferson, it, it's going to be a year for him. But uh, yeah, Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. Cooper Cup, like both high floor wide receiver twos, but Cup has the, the higher ceiling and therefore that's why we have him ranked ahead of Woods. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, Cup and Woods, I think are going – probably at cost. But if you think the Rams are going to bounce back and Sean McVay is going to find it again, I mean, you can make a case that the rest of the guys, Cam Akers, Gerald Everett, Jared Goff, uh, 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 Josh Reynolds are all going, you know, way later than they should, assuming that if you think the Rams are going to have a big year. And so I think there's some best ball stacks to be had if you end up with Cups, with Cup or Woods in round three, round four, creating Rams best ball stacks, I think is somewhat interesting, uh, at least to think about. Okay, we're we'll back later this week with Mike Leone to talk about some positional strategy guides. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, hit subscribe, leave us a review. It's all free. So for producer Luke, for Evan, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.